Right now it is time for the Media Beat, and that means it is time for us to bring in David Tarachuk with the Media Beat. Uh, David joins us on a Friday morning, and uh, he, of course, has his own terrific website, themediabeat.us. But David is also a PBS television correspondent reporting on ethics and belief. And uh, another wild uh, preceding few days before we get together uh, in the news, David. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad to be reporting in from the great state of Maine again, continuing my break from uh, my usual base in the media capital of the world, New York City. Uh, <clears throat> but, I mean, media is everywhere now, and uh, I'm glad to be joining the ever alert Marshall Miles to talk about it. Yes, quite a week. Uh, you're right. Um, you know, Marshall, one of our uh, broadcasting colleagues said on air, uh, this week on a national show that she'd woken up uh, to what felt like a time warp. Uh, all the news seems to be about Donald Trump once again. Well, that, we, well that, we that back a few years. But no, but that's true. Um, it it, <laughs> it, sure. it, 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 it it's because it's breaking news. Yeah. Uh, so now, uh, so what's what's what. Is this well, see- we've got everything, haven't we? We've got that early morning FBI raid on his Florida resort home, We're looking for just what we still haven't been fully told. A, a judge will decide if uh, we can be told, and, and within a day or two, the man himself was invoking the Fifth Amendment while being deposed uh, unwillingly, only under pain of subpoena, uh, by the Attorney General's Office of uh, New York State. Uh, his, uh, <clears throat> he took the first on the grounds, of course, that he might incriminate himself for something. Who knows what? Um, his own press statement uh, reminded us that he had in the past asked, um, why do people take the fifth if they're innocent? Uh, but now he knows the answer, he says. Uh, and, of course, he is innocent uh, of any crime, he also says. Um what he did not remind us about uh, in that statement is uh, that his exact quote while asking that old innocent so naive question um, included the phrase you see the mob takes the fifth uh, out of the mouths of Donald Trump um, we're obviously not meant to equate Donald J. Trump uh, with the mafia uh, heaven forbid um, and among all the torrents of commentary about that uh, legal travails of uh, the former guy, uh, to use uh, President Biden's simple label for him, uh, it has come from um, uh, an opinion piece from my hometown's Brennan, Brennan Center for Justice. You'll know that, I'm sure. Well, you'll know that, I'm sure. Um, the, the, the senior fellow, Caroline Fredrickson, pointed out that being seen to be persecuted, allegedly, by federal officers is now a badge of honor in the Republican Party. Uh, so much for the party of law and order, huh? I mean, we've noticed this week um, the propagandist onslaught against uh, the FBI and uh, Attorney General Garland Merrick, of co- Merrick Garland, of course. Uh, it was predictable and huge and, and extreme. Um, some of the uh, Republicans, in, including Steve Bannon, the one-time very close advisor to Trump, calling uh, the FBI the Gestapo. Well, we don't know the party affiliation of the guy involved, but uh, the particular guy involved, but I guess it was only a matter of time. It took hardly any time before someone, in this case uh, a certain Ricky Schiffer, aged 42, uh, a man with a gun and wearing body armor, was already attempting only yesterday, uh, to break into an FBI office in uh, Ohio. Um, That led to a car chase with shots fired, and eventually he was killed by a law enforcement officer. Um, It looks like uh, immediately after uh, the FBI raid, uh, an account, supposedly uh, Schiffer's own account, uh, posted what was quite literally a, a call to arms on Trump's own uh, social media site, Truth Social. What a name, huh? Uh, and uh, there was in in, in that post was a, a threat to quote kill FBI on site. Um, 
And it also echoed, of course, Steve Bannon's description of the FBI as Gestapo. And, and, and Schiffer, if it, indeed it was he in this uh, uh, posting, it, it still hasn't been absolutely confirmed to be him, but it, the likelihood is huge. Uh, he even posted uh, only minutes after his attack yesterday in Ohio um, that uh, he was... He, he was the man who uh, who tried to uh, shatter the uh, bulletproof glass. He failed, he said, um, and uh, and we know the outcome. Um, I mean, is this uh, another right-wing extremist martyr in the making? Uh, we'll doubtless see many social media postings uh, to that effect over over this week. Here's what's, what the problem with social media is. Uh, uh, on, I think it was Newsmax, that outstanding news network. <clears throat> um, they had a guest. They, they had a guest on a show, and he basically. Uh, and I won't. I can't remember his name, but he was a prominent, a recognizable figure, uh, who who's claiming that uh, he predicts uh, the FBI is so corrupt that uh, Donald Trump, they'll, they'll assassinate Donald Trump to prevent him from running for a second term. See, these are the comments that when they're said and they're broadcast, then reach people who think, well, you know, maybe I'll be the one to do that. That's, that's, that's the danger of this in, in today's society. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, the First Amendment is a valuable part of our democracy, of course. Uh, free speech, freedom of assembly, uh, and uh, freedom of religion, too, of course. But free speech, uh, <clears throat> it's, um, it's an old adage, and it's well worth repeating again. Uh, of course, uh, uh, speech ought to be free. Uh, we ought to be able to, to say anything uh, we like. Uh, uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, there's a certain sense of social responsibility that, that uh, has to come in here. Uh, the, the classic argument uh, revolves around that, that notion. It, I mean, it's theoretical, but it, uh, it, it's clearly very pointed and illustrative. Uh, the free speech does not include the freedom to shout fire in a crowded theater and thus, you know, cause chaos uh, and, and perhaps death. Um, yeah, uh, with moderation of, uh, of, uh, uh, of communication. Uh, is, is also a hallmark of a mature democracy. Uh, it, it, it's hard to...
himself, it was served on him. He's perfectly at liberty to, to publicize the contents of that warrant himself, but he's not done so uh, rather pointedly, I think. Uh, but he is, <clears throat> you know, he is demanding that it should be released officially. Uh, I can sort of see the point in that, the rhetorical point in that. Um, but uh, when that warrant gets uh, agreed to by the judge, if that's what's hap- what, what happens, and since uh, uh, Trump is not objecting to it, then in all likelihood it will be revealed. And, of course, the, the, the receipt, as it were, the property list, the, um, the inventory of what has been taken from Mar-a-Lago uh, will also be somewhat revealing when it, when it is uh, uh, when it is made public too, which is the other part of the uh, of the application to the judge, what will not be revealed, and, and I think uh, anyone following the story needs to bear this in mind, what will not be revealed is the affidavit behind the uh, the FBI's own uh, application for the warrant, which you know it, it too was subject to the approval of a judge. And uh, a, a judge was convinced by the FBI that a warrant was warranted. <laughs> and uh, the way you do that is uh, set out some, at least, of your thinking about why you need the warrant. Um, it may become clear w- when the warrant itself is, is published what crime is, uh, is in the FBI's mind as it pursues the, the, its inquiries. Uh, but the affidavit uh, will also would, if it were made public, and it won't be, uh, because it's an ongoing investigation. Uh, what that uh, would reveal is uh, what evidence the FBI thinks it already has for a crime being committed. So um, we must watch this space and, and watch it carefully. Uh, it's going to develop, uh, keep on developing the story, and. and uh, you know, it, it comes in the midst of lots of, uh, to use the euphemistic phrase again, the legal travails of Trump, you know, both at federal level and at state level, both in New York and in, um, and in Georgia on the, uh, on the uh, vote-finding uh, investigation. Uh, I refer, of course, to Trump's efforts to, uh, to produce somehow or get the Georgian uh, <clears throat> election authorities to... Uh, produce <laughs> somehow out of thin air the votes that he needed to be able to claim he won. Well, we're uh, uh, talking with David Terrachuk, and once again, we're about to bring back the fanfare, David. Yes, it's uh, we've not been finding uh, examples <laughs> of good journalism that, that prompt us to, to fanfare it and highlight it. But let's hear the fanfare for one particularly good piece of journalism this week. Let's hear it. Cheering to hear that again. <laughs> it's a fanfare this week for The Atlantic magazine uh, for its uh, really detailed reenactment. We're looking back now again to the Trump time uh, in an almost kind of time warp way. Uh, but this is a reenactment blow by blow uh, of the Trump administration's policy, call it that, of deliberately splitting families in order to deter immigration. Uh, we discussed this uh, at length when it was in operation, that policy of, of taking children from their parents. Uh, back in 2018, Marshall, you'll remember, halfway through Trump's term. And I was at the time viewing the reaction from France, where the government there reacted in disgust at uh, the U.S. government policy. There was a big headline in Le Monde, the Paris newspaper, saying that uh, border separations show that uh, show to the US that, that um, Europe uh, cannot possibly share the same model of, uh, of uh, civilization it was regarded as a as a, a piece of horrible uh, inhumanity a, a, a demonstration of, of, of inhumane treatment uh, which, which uh, went against all principles of, of modern civilization um, and, and looking back on it now, as the Atlantic has done, uh, a very <clears throat> in a piece that really um, 
sums the whole thing up in a, in a, in a, in a, in a powerful uh, headline and then goes and follows it with some very good journalistic work. Um, the headline was, We Need to Take Away Children. A direct quote, by the way, from an attorney uh, involved in the, in the policy making, uh, coming out of a meeting with the, uh, the attorney general uh, in, in Trump's administration. Um, the, the subtitle is the, the, the Secret History of the Family Separation Policy. Um, it's a textbook piece of uh, investigative journalism, and it works from the, uh, from the immediacy and horror of mothers having kids torn from their arms right through to the, the overarching uh, political background, the constant pressure charted uh, almost day by day in, in the writing here. Uh, pressure being applied from the Trump White House, in particular from uh, so-called policy advisor Stephen Miller, um, another of the Steves who had influence on Trump. Um, the, the pressure he was applying on, on the staff of the, all the agents, the government agencies involved, uh, including I, I, it, this is uh, spelled out in the in the article very strongly. Uh, it included the hopelessly, incredibly outmaneuvered senior cabinet member, uh, the Secretary for Homeland Security, Kirstjen Nielsen. Uh, and as I say, it's a blow-by-blow account, well deserving of being laid out in seven dense, but still compelling uh, chapters, seven chapters in this article, uh, charting a policy that was not only inhumane, deliberately so, uh, and probably illegally so, uh, but also incompetently carried out. Uh, there was no effective, uh, effectively, there was no, no space for the children to be kept in once they were taken from their parents. Warehouses and tented camps, you remember, had to be employed. Uh, and we all remember, I'm sure, the, the, the uh, illicit uh, audio recording, but thank goodness it was made, uh, that was re- it was leaked. Uh, somebody recorded uh, the voices of children between four and ten years old, all wailing in distress inside a Customs and Border Protection detention facility, and, and the, the guards were making jokes about them being an orchestra without a conductor. Um, one, of those, one of the article uh, <clears throat> itemizes, amongst many things, one special outrage uh, is the policy's lasting effects. Uh, trauma, of course, on, on the families. Uh, the children especially. And and despite the Biden administration's efforts right from the start of its term uh, to reunite the families, um, there are still over 100, maybe close to 200 families who are still not reunited. Tracing them is impossible because of the, the cruel recklessness that split them up in the first place. And in fact, uh, no record was kept to keep track of where the children and parents were taken in the d- different directions. Uh, and it's interesting as we survey the story now, from, you know, right here in 2022, a midterm elections year, to note that the beginnings of Trump's climb down, the, the, it was necessary for him to climb down, of course, uh, because of the uh, reaction. Uh, and, 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 you know, they finally rescinded the splitting families practice. Uh, was the fear that the furore about it uh, would make the Republicans lose that year's midterm elections. Well, they did lose the House, though they did just hold on to the Senate. Um, I'm wondering now, in in light of that historical point, uh, is there an issue that could work that badly for the GOP in November 2022? Um, Some journalists this week are highlighting that uh, Americans being robbed of their long-established abortion rights uh, might just possibly be such an issue. Um, We will see. It's going to be very interesting to see. In in the last few minutes, I want to get to uh, 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 what's going on uh, in the Ukraine as um, a major story, uh, which is now overlooked, of course, by what happened with Donald Trump, was the uh, unbelievably impressive attack uh, on the airfield in Crimea uh, with long-range artillery that looks like it has the possibility to really change the face of now Russia having to fight on 
two different fronts, the, the eastern front and also maybe now the front down by Crimea. I mean, but this is a big, this is a, 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 a very big news story in, in, in what's going on between Russia and Ukraine. Sure. Um, it's been constantly referred to. I see the word coming up again and again in journalistic uh, accounts of the war now, the word grinding. Uh, the war grinds on. Uh, but one of the interesting things, of course, is is, is even though uh, there's no direct intervention by the West, there's so much support for uh, Ukraine that uh, its own extraordinary resilience is now being helped, well, has been right from the beginning. Well, it, it, not right from the beginning, but the, the assistance has grown fast uh, since the beginning of the war, the, the, the invasion uh, unprovoked invasion by um, uh, Putin's armies. Um, the, the, what we've seen is uh, the Ukrainians being enabled uh, to uh, transform their uh, their willingness to fight into very practical uh, fighting terms. And uh, yes, uh, modern uh, armaments uh, in in many ways much superior to to the Russians. The Russians seem to have expended some of their most sophisticated weaponry already uh, and are now falling back onto Soviet-era uh, weaponry, uh, nowhere near as effective or as, accu as accurate, which also has its terrible downside, of course. The, the civilian casualties are, are mounting. Uh, but, but Russians uh, are losing um, uh, their, their soldiery. Too, uh, and indeed, you know, quite significantly, uh, many of the very senior officers, too, generals are dying at, a, at an extraordinary rate that uh, uh, Soviet armed forces are not used to seeing happening. But yes, an, an attack right in the middle of Soviet occupied uh, Crimea is a striking piece. I mean, a terrible, an over, over obvious word there, but a, but a, a remarkable piece of uh, effective. Uh, response uh, by the Ukrainians. Uh, Pre President Zelensky is, is suggesting that uh, uh, we should not make too much of it. Uh, he's also uh, urging uh, his own people, uh, particularly politicians, to go easy on how much they talk about uh, uh, what, uh, what the Ukrainian side might be doing. Uh, because, of course, one of the hallmarks of uh, effective military operations is that you don't uh, blab too much about what your intentions are and what your capacity, what you believe your own capacity to be. Uh, here's, a, here's a classic uh, case of, um, you know, uh, need, the need-to-know basis. Uh, the <coughs> Ukrainians are being, uh, <coughs> Ukrainian success is being reported on, uh, particularly in, particularly deeply and revealingly by in the West, rather interestingly by both the Washington Post and the New York Times. But, uh, but Zelensky is feeling that maybe we shouldn't be uh, <clears throat> making it too clear what exactly the Ukrainians are up to, uh, because you know secrecy uh, helps them. Uh, they don't really want uh, Russian generals read, reading in the Washington Post and the New York Times about uh, uh, what Ukrainian forces could be doing next. Um, so, yeah, uh, the war grinds on, but, it, but the, the advantage could possibly swing uh, from one side to the other. Uh, and, and, and who knows? Who knows that where this is going to take us? At some point, it will take us to... Uh, I can, you know, everyone who watches war will know this. Uh, it will take us to the uh, negotiating table at some point, uh, and what level of advantage uh, each side has when that point is reached is uh, really open to question. Uh, but yes, the the, the, the the successful responses of uh, the Ukrainian side, the Ukrainian side in in recent days, has been extraordinary. Well, with all that's going on in the world, you're right. Uh, what happened over the previous two days has uh, brought every network, it seems, or most networks, into uh, Trump, 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 Trump stories, anti-Trump, pro-Trump stories, <laughs> and uh, overshadowing other events that are happening in the news. Well, um, that's, that's the way of American press. I mean, <laughs> uh, to talk about a herd in 
uh, is to underestimate uh, the way that uh, uh, the media world in general uh, goes. Um, uh, you, you can find other stories, of course you can, but uh, what gets the headlines, what, uh, what comes to the top of everyone's uh, uh, agenda uh, is, is uh, universally agreed right now to be this one topic. And uh, I guess you can't blame the, the press in general for that. Uh, if it's important, then it goes to the top. And, and uh, most people can, I, I, I think, probably agree that this is an important inflection point in the whole Trump story. Uh, but, you know, it's early days yet. We'll see if uh, things change for the Trump family and the Trump organization and the Trump potential candidacy for 2024. We will see. All right. Well, enjoy your rest of the time in Maine. How, how, when do you, how long are you staying in Maine? Two or three more weeks, probably, and then back to the media capital of the world, New York City. All right, we'll speak to you next week, David. Look forward to that. Take care. Uh, David Tarachuk with The Media Beat. Of course, you can find David at his own website, themediabeat.us, and here at Robin Hood Radio, robinhoodradio.com. Click on On Demand. Click on The Media Beat with David Tarachuk.